Owen Drilagosh, Dr. Owen Drilagosh, is currently Associate Professor and former head of the Department of English at Diamond Harbour Women's University in Kolkata. Her doctoral thesis, which was awarded back in 2013, was on the treatment of motherhood in the shorter fiction of Thomas Hardy. She has been awarded the Charles Wallace India Trust UK Short Research Grant twice which enabled her to come over here for research, for pre- and post-doc research. She has been a speaker twice at the Hardy Society Biennial Conferences, 2014 and 2016, and she is the recipient of the prestigious Frank Pinion Award, which we awarded to her in 2014. Apart from a number of notable and often cited essays on Hardy in international journals, she has also edited two volumes, Protean Images, a study of womanhood in Victorian society and literature, and An Enigma Called Emily, reassessing Emily Bronte at 200. Her third one has now also been published. It says here forthcoming, but of course this is no longer April. So, Visitation, Deception and Contestation, Interrogating Gender and the Supernatural in Victorian Shorter Fiction. And it's a fabulous book, not just because I'm in it. Anyway, her current research interests and projects and publications thereof are centred around Bollywood adaptations of Hardy's works and in establishing the probable Asian and Indian connections that Hardy had through his unpublished correspondence. And she's actually been working on a project for the last year and a half now, Hardy's Indian correspondence, and she's found some pretty amazing stuff. So hopefully we'll have something on that soon for you. So may I present Dr. Oendri Lagosh. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today at the Tess of the D'Urbervilles study day and I'm extremely grateful to the Thomas Hardy Society and especially to my dear friend Dr. Tracy Hayes for inviting me to deliver this plenary lecture at the study day. As has already perhaps been circulated uh, and you are aware that the, that the title of my talk is Hardy's Tess Adaptations, Cultural Transpositions, and Alternative Modernity. Now, Thomas Hardy's novels have always been a popular choice for film adaptations, owing to their cinematic qualities of atmosphere and imagery. And ever since the release of the most recent film adaptation of his novel, Far From the Madding Crowd in 2015, there have been a spate of re-evaluations of Hardy's works, particularly in relation to their on-screen adaptations. This is also the time when I personally got interested in looking for uh, uh, the, the influence of Hardy's novels, his works, on Indian cinema. And obviously the starting point was Bollywood, but this is a continuing research and project where I will be trying to look at uh, the possible influence or the possible adaptation of Hardy's novels in other Indian languages. Now, the success of the transfer to the medium of films is perhaps, with reference to Hardy's novels, is due to the sensational elements that are present within Hardy's plots and also his uncanny ability to portray the complexity of relationships be between the sexes uh, so, uh, so wonderfully well. Yet, many critics of Hardy's film adaptations are of the opinion that Hardy's novels cannot be faithfully transferred to the screen due to his techniques of utilizing multiple perspectives and multiple voices. And this, I think, is particularly attenuated in the case of transnational and cross-cultural adaptations which need to take into account both the 19th century British context of the original tales and the relevance of the plots to a heterogeneous Asian or Indian film viewing audience. Now, these in turn also raise several important and pertinent issues regarding adaptations in general. The vital question then looming before us is what after all is the value of fidelity in adaptations? Since most discussions of adaptation necessarily concern this dual-pronged notion of fidelity and transformation. 
Most practitioners and theorists of the field are of the opinion that adaptations ought to be faithful to the source texts. Fidelity is also often thought to be harmful because it perhaps eliminates alternative or more fruitful lines of inquiry. Paisley Livingston, in his essay, which is called On the Appreciation of Cinematic Adaptations, says, and I quote, For a work to be an adaptation, many of the distinguishing and characteristic features of the sources, such as the title, setting, et al., must be expressly adopted and imitated in the new, new work. As adaptations are distinct from mere copies or reproductions, they must also be intentionally made to diverge from the source in crucial aspects. Close quotes. Thus, Livingston's argument establishes that fidelity is a necessary prerequisite and cogent critical approach to understanding, decoding, and appreciating adaptations per se. However, in his view, in some cases, fidelity improves an adaptation, but it might also harm it. This thus puts the burden of discretion on the filmmaker of what shall work best through transposition and intermediality. My point will be to argue along these lines through close reading of the adaptations of the Bollywood versions to reveal how fidelity and departure have contributed to the success or failure of the adaptation. One can certainly claim the popularity of the adaptations of Hardy's novels amongst Indian filmmakers who have indeed successfully transmogrified 19th century rural Britain for an Indian public otherwise spatially removed and also geographically and chronologically far removed from the 19th century original context of the novels. Hardy's novels are immensely popular among Indian readers. They have been translated into Hindi and a number of other major Indian languages and multiple number of multiple times. Uh, but my argument is to be able to illustrate that it is cinema rather than print culture which has aided the dissemination of Hardy's novels among non-English readers of uh, Hardy in India. The plots of Hardy's novels have appealed to Indian filmmakers since the 1940s because the sensational elements within his plots guaranteed commercial success. And I have been trying to investigate why and to what extent mainstream Indian cinema is indented, indebted to, the, uh, uh, to and influenced by Hardy's works with particular reference to two films, both of which are adaptations of Tess of the Durbervilles, one which was made in 1967 called Dulhan Ek Raat Ki, and the other one, Prem Granth, released in 1996. It is easy to understand why Hardy's movies appeal to the Indian film industry since they contain images of a rural community and its economy in a state of transition as well as a complex web of folklore and customs that are present in the metrics of his tales. The plots and settings of his novels find many resonances in the Indian social and cultural matrix. Furthermore, reflections of Victorian morality its, its so-called prudery and the social strictures also resonate with Indian societal mores which were faithfully mirrored in the early years of its main, mainstream popular cinema symbolized by Bollywood. By analyzing these films that I have mentioned, it will be the objective to assess the degree of success or failure of their attempts to adapt Hardy's popular novels for a uh, the popular audiences uh, of early Indian cinema. And I have also been trying to investigate the problems and potential dangers that are inherent in reverse cultural appropriations in how Wessex is transported to India via the motives of Bollywood glamour, music and melodrama. The process of adapting British fiction into Indian commercial Indian cinema 
has a history dating back decades. And if I'm trying to say that Indian filmmakers have been influenced by Hardy's plots and Hardy's works, it doesn't mean that there have not been other prior adaptations or uh, there there are no other uh, authors who are being uh, works of whom are being adapted and very well adapted for, to suit the Indian audiences. And uh, this practice has attained its peak in recent years with the adaptations of Shakespearean tragedies by the musician and filmmaker Vishal Bharadwaj, whose Makbul, which is an adaptation of Macbeth, Omkara, an adaptation of Othello, and Haider, an adaptation of Hamlet, have won him many accolades not only from uh, the country itself but internationally. The recent adaptation of Dickens's Great Expectations in 2016 in the Bollywood movie Fitur has also proved immensely successful and uh, all of them have used the, the principles of fidelity and departure at the same time to arrive at these successful uh, formula for commercial success uh, would be a better way of putting it. These movies work by the process of reverse cultural appropriation. Cultural appropriation has uh, been successful because they adapt the English writer's stories to relatable Indianized culture settings, cultural routings and contemporary events. Similarly, adaptation of Hardy's novels by Bollywood cinema has a history dating back to early pre-independence era. For instance, one of the first adaptations of Tess of the Durbervilles was supposedly Monkey Jeet, uh, a film which uh, the title of which roughly translates to something like Victory of the Heart. Directed by W. Z. Ahmed in 1944, unfortunately, it no long it is no longer available. The print of this movie is unavailable for researchers and audiences. The films. Uh, which I will talk first of all, are films by Indian filmmakers influenced by tastes of early conservative and evolving Indian audiences with expectations already shaped by typical Bollywood masala or spice movies. An important point that may now be raised by viewers of Hardy's film adaptations are how successful are these adaptations or how successful were these adaptations how much did they add to or take away from the original narrative? That means the questions of fidelity and departure that with which we began can be applied and can be put to test when someone is watching these adaptations of Hardy. How much uh, and what are the outcomes of Indian adaptations? How far do appropriations work? Exploring answers to these questions shall be vital to our discussion. These adaptations were able to deftly appropriate the universal elements of Hardy's plots. The sexual double standards, exploitation of the rural poor, or an agrarian economy in transition and flux, which were an easy to supplant onto Indian metrics by the Indian filmmakers. And this can be supported by the commercial successful of success of these films where the audiences were mostly unaware of the fact of imitations or adaptations of plots of British novels. And neither did that ignorance hamper the film viewing experience in any way. The Indian adaptations were evidently not uh, keen on owning up to their borrowings from Hardy or were borrowing in turn from earlier film adaptation films adapted from the novels as in the case of another Bollywood uh, uh, adaptation of Hardy's The Mayor of Casterbridge which is called Dag, about which I'll mention just in the passing if there is time at the end of uh, my talk which was adapted not directly from The Mayor of Casterbridge but from the BBC film adaptation and obviously the questions of intellectual uh, property rights might be raised in our minds when we think of this but that was not a prominent uh, or uh, sort of uh, regularly uh, implemented practice at that particular time when the films in questions were being made uh, and these questions of intellectual property rights and ethics of course did take a back seat and uh, they did provide the filmmakers at the same time a degree of freedom to make alterations to the plots without being directly charged of tampering 
with uh, the original. If we were to go by the words of Bela Belash, who wrote in his book Theory of the Film, and I quote from that book, a film script writer adapting the play may use the existing work of art merely as raw material, regarded from the specific angle of his own art form as it were raw reality, and pay no attention to the form once already given to the material. Close quotes. Then most of these adaptations that I'm talking about, uh, and especially uh, these uh, adaptations of Hardy's uh, novels into Hindi films, were new pieces of art in a different medium where the filmmaker had the license to ignore the notions of equivalence and extract only that which is most suitable to the cinematic medium. Singular thus amongst theorists of adaptations, Bellage suggests that the crucial process of adaptation from a literary source occurs not in the filming process but in the creation of the screenplay from the literary source, though his contention has received severe, severe challenges from other theorists. Having said this, it is still interesting to embark upon scrutinizing the adherences to and departures from the original novels in the cross-cultural Hindi adaptations of Hardy to see that how adaptation based on the principles of fidelity as well as uh, based on the principles of um, departing from being uh, absolutely loyal to the source text worked for these worked or did not work for these adaptations. Dulhanik Ratki or Pride of a Night made in 1967 starred the celebrated Hindi actors Dharmendra in the role of Ashok who is the angel figure of the film and Nutan played by the role of uh, playing the role of Nirmala a slightly older Tess. Uh, both were noted actors of their time, known for the seriousness of their performances, lending the, feel, the film the tragic somberness that the story demanded. However, certain changes had to be made in order to make the story credible and acceptable to an Indian audience. Thus, Ashok and Nirmala meet at Dehradun railway station Dehradun, a small uh, 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 hills, uh, hill, uh, hill town or it's a hill station which uh, is in northern part of India. A prolonged encounter necessitating an argument over who in fact has hailed a tonga or a horse-drawn cart first with the duo finally being forced to travel together. So this is the first situation in which our Angel and Tess meet for the first time. This is a very, very clear and important departure from the May Day club walking and dance scene early in the novel where it can be argued that the tragedy of uh, that is contained in the plot of Tess is initiated by Angel's overlooking of Tess in favour of a different dance partner. In the Indian adaptation, the meeting becomes a comic scene with Ashok alighting at a friend's abode where Nirmala is erroneously thought to be Ashok's coy, newly wedded wife. This removal of the club walking scene from the Indian adaptation serves to remove the very, very deep-rooted symbolism that is present in the original text. The, 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 the white dress that Tess wears, the red ribbon and everything else that is associated with that scene with, which has uh, repercussions in, in, in the rest of the plot at a symbolic level. All that is eliminated at one go. The initial ingredients for a tragic development which are so clearly present early on in Hardy's narrative are not given prominence in the Indian film adaptation. And yet this idea of people travelling through rail, meeting uh, at railway stations and uh, uh, bec becoming acquaintances and uh, things uh, going to cross purposes perhaps during such meetings, all that is very, very credible, at, le at least in the 1960s, because railway travel is, uh, is becoming uh, even more uh, popular, especially from people moving from the urban centers to these semi-urban centers. So that becomes very credible to the Indian audiences of the hero and the heroine meeting at the railway station. Another major contextual change made by the Indian scriptwriter is with respect to the heroine's age and the levels of her education. 
Nirmala has returned to Dehradun after completing her graduation, which roughly translates to three years of undergraduate college in India, which means that she is not less than a woman of 19 or 20. Thus, she has become a completely different entity from the 16-year-old Tess of Hardy's novel. With her incomplete education, unfulfilled dreams of becoming a school teacher, and most crucially, being legally a minor. This change has a significant impact upon the central episode in the film which involves the violation of Tess. On her return, Nirmala learns that her widowed mother has had to mortgage the ancestral home in order to pay for her education. While perhaps we might not agree that this is a tragic event as great as the death of Prince, for the Derbyfield family, the knowledge of how her education was obtained acts as a major catalyst for her ensuing sense of guilt and sense of responsibility and uh, the hurry uh, where she decides to search for work immediately. The Indian adaptation shadows the original plot when Nirmala goes to work as nurse for a rich, blind widow. Here Nirmala meets Ranjit, the Alec figure of the film, the lady's son who is played by Rahman, the popular villain of the black and white era of Bollywood cinema. This first encounter between Nirmala and Ranjit echoes that between Tess and Angel. And I'll try to sort of send a clip also, I don't know if that could be incorporated or played, which will show exactly uh, uh, how the filmmaker has very closely read the plot, the text, the novel, and has translated the subtle nuances of this passage, perhaps, uh, in, in the first encounter between uh, Ranjit and Nirmala. The manner in which Ranjit leers at Nirmala brings to mind the following passage from the novel. And I quote, this is from chapter 5 of The Maiden phase. He watched her pretty, pretty and unconscious munching through the skeins of smoke that pervaded the tent. And Tess Derbyfield did not divine as she innocently looked down at the roses in her bosom that there behind the blue narcotic haze was potentially the tragic mischief of her drama, one who stood fair to be the blood-red ray in the spectrum of her young life." Close quotes. The film departs from the novel also when Nirmala and Ashok become lovers very early on in the film. Ashok, however, has to leave Dehradun uh, for employment elsewhere and after giving Nirmala a bracelet as a token, of his, a token or a symbol of his attachment to her. Uh, as nurse to the blind old lady, Nirmala is left vulnerable to the lustful advances of Ranjit. Significantly, readers of Hardy's original novel would note that because Nirmala is older, and thus, more mature than the 16-year-old Tess, the intentions of Ranjit are much clearer to her and she can act accordingly. As with Tess, destiny overrules Nirmala's caution and she agrees one fateful day to Ranjit driving her home in his car late at night after a party hosted at his house. During the journey, he rapes her. In Tess, the scene in the chase is controversial because Hardy has left it ambiguous. Hardy's narrator remains neutral during the event, partly due to Victorian censorship, but also to force his readers to define issues of physical and moral chastity and dissociate the two. This early Indian film adaptation also refuses to delineate the rape scene explicitly, though only out of respect for a conservative film audience. The violence with which Nirmala's bangle, that same token which is left to her by Ashok, levels of education empowers Nirmala more than it does Tess in the original novel. And uh, unlike the novel in this film, the heroine is not given the chance to experience motherhood or to express her anguish at the sexual double standards of a patriarchal society. Rather, she is given a chance to start life anew with the respectability as a schoolmistress reminiscent of one of Hardy's other heroines, Leonara Frankland from the short story For Conscience Sake in uh, the volume of short stories Life's Li Little Irony. Had the child lived, it would have made a journey back to respectability for a middle-class unwed mother in India in the 1960s impossible. 
The social stigma attached to Nirmala would have made her a social outcast and driven her to either prostitution or suicide. Suicide. Much like in Tess, the diatribe of Nirmala against why the woman always pays makes the film a very faithful adaptation by blurring the geographical and chronological boundaries which separate the backdrop of the novel and the Indian adaptation, proving beyond doubt the universality of Hardy's creative vision. In her new role as schoolmistress in a nameless and distant town, Nirmala bumps once again into Ashok, who now proposes marriage to her. And after initial rejections and refusals, Nirmala concedes, but not before she has written a letter of confession, which again, true to Hardy's original, gets mislaid only to be delivered to Ashok on their wedding night. On being confronted with Nirmala's past, Ashok reacts in the same manner as Angel Clare finds himself, finding himself unable to recognize that Nirmala he had once loved is this woman before him with her tarnished past. It is very important to analyze here the rationale behind Ashok's rejection of his bride. There is in Ashok's mind a clear sense of incredulousness that Nirmala could not have uh, prevented her misfortune, which was not so in the case of Angel Clare, uh, since he accepted that Tess was more sinned against than sinning, even as he failed to overcome his own moral myopia. But as a woman who is mature enough to recognize the danger in men folk, possessing a clearer and better understanding of things as it were, and um, if not complete understanding of Ranjit's intentions. A very significant point of departure this from Tess, uh, the novel, takes place in this Bollywood adaptation with regard to the question, question then of the, in, question, um, of the incident in the chase. Was it to be viewed as a rape or as a seduction? And how would the woman be regarded in the case of either possibility? Hardy's use of ambiguity during this scene, along with his choice of subtitle for the novel, was to problematize the question of purity by challenging Victorian associations of uh, uh, physical chastity rather than purity of the mind or intention, something that I have mentioned uh, uh, just a while back. The deliberate gap in the narrative during the event serves to sow seeds of doubt in the reader's mind, leading them to read the incident as a seduction, even if a coerced one. But in a different socio-cultural setting, this early Bollywood product production could not have allowed the possibility of the woman being seduced or in any way complicit in the act. Such an idea would be uh, quite unacceptable to Indian audiences and the censor board uh, censorship board alike, alike. The incident is explicitly presented as a violent rape. There is no ambiguity in the case as there is in the novel and uh, in the wedding night confession, Nirmala constantly keeps saying that there was no question of consent in this. She had no consent. It is only Ashok who entertains doubts as to whether the event was a rape or a seduction, making it an interesting departure from the original. So the theatre of ambiguity uh, opens up in the mind of Ashok and not in the narrative or the, or, or the portrayal of the character, characters in the movie. Abandoned by Ashok and left heartbroken, Nirmala once again leaves her home, this time to work as a governess in a large household. Here begins the flintcomb ash phase of, of the film. Nirmala again encounters Alec Ranjit, who is now possessing as a, as a converted Swami Premanand in the saffron robes of an ascetic. Like Alec, Ranjit is awoken from his temporary conversion by this chance meeting and the next time that we see him, he is once again attired in dandy clothes and with a lustful mien confesses to a relapse of his true nature after the encounter. As opposed to Angel's journey to Brazil and his eventual softening of heart, in this adaptation, Ashok is motivated to reconcile with Nirmala at the request of his dying father, who wishes to see his wife in his final moments though he had greatly objected to the marriage earlier in the film. Ashok then writes a letter conveying his wish to reunite with Nirmala. She is exuberant, but as with Alec, Ranjit convinces Nirmala that her husband will not return, for she rightfully and naturally belongs to him. While Nirmala awaits Ashok's arrival, Ranjit intercepts him and deceives Ashok into thinking that Nirmala now lives with him, which is almost akin to the Sanborn phase in Tess. In a bid to expose Ranjit's falsehood 
and in desperation, Nirmala stabs him with a kitchen knife and rushes out in desperate pursuit of Ashok. A now repentant Ashok regrets his abandonment of Nirmala and wishes to atone by accepting the blame for the murder, but it is too late and the deed has been witnessed by the neighbours around Nirmala's house. The reunited couple escape into the forest and find temporary shelter in a cave. The marriage is consummated and Nirmala does indeed become a bride of a knight. Even as the police are heard in the background, Nirmala's final moments consist of a diatribe at being a marionette in the hands of destiny. The precedent of the immortals had ended this post with test, seems to resonate and sim seems to ring in our ears as Nirmala speaks these lines in the movie. Such nuances that this film re- ensured that this film remains one of the best adaptations by Bollywood uh, of Hardy's Tess of the Durbervilles. The novel's ending is changed for the film Dulhan Ek Raat Ki in order to appeal to the Indian social and cultural psyche and to deepen, deepen the uh, uh, significance of the tragic outcome of Nirmala's life. While the symbolic joining of hands of Angel and Lisa Lu after Tess's hanging sometimes has been misread uh, as an optimistic ending, the lack of legal sanction behind marrying one's deceased wife sister in Victorian England intensifies Hardy's ending by hinting at a tragic replication of Tess's fate if this were to happen at all. The Indian director, for the very same purpose of retaining the grimness, omits this possibility in order to maintain a tragic in- ending. For an Indian culture, it is an accepted custom for a man to marry his deceased wife's sister and hence perhaps Nirmala has no sisters to render the tragedy extremely bleak. I shall now very quickly move on to the next second adaptation which is Prem Granth released in 1996 and directed by Rajiv Kapoor under the very famous banner of his filmmaker father Raj Kapoor's RK films. The r- movie starred an aging Rishi Kapoor who was once upon a time a teenage heart- heartthrob of Tinseltown and the diva of the 1980s and 19s of Bollywood cinema Madhuri Dixit. This rather inferior, I would say, adaptation of Tess is based not in the semi-urban locale of Dehradun but in a deeply caste-ridden rustic setting. The insurmountable barrier between the lower and upper castes, especially in a village, replicate Hardy's depiction of rural barriers in Victorian England. Only here, the consequences of transgression meet with violent reprisals. The story revolves around Soman, a lawyer and, a, and the son of the head priest of the village, Temple, Swami Dharam Bhushan Maharaj, a man with a very strong character and courage of conviction. Unlike the earlier adaptation, this one utilizes the character of Parson Clare, but without his eclecticism. Bhushan is a firm supporter of the rigidities of caste mores. Soman, however, believes in the principles of equality and freedom and often confronts his father on issues of social justice and religion. His uncle Nandalal owns a prosperous dairy farm and keeps himself away from the affairs of religion and social obligations, citing them as unjust and outdated. This adaptation, though flawed, actually comes closer to resembling Hardy's novel and its emphasis on the class status distinction between Tess and Angel. Soman meets a beautiful young woman, Kajri, at an annual festival who is uh, equivalent to the Tess uh, figure in the film and uh, and is immediately drawn towards her, her lower social caste notwithstanding. They part unexpectedly and Soman's attempts to find Kajri are in vain. Kajri and her father Baliram are on their way back to their village Bansipura where en route Kajri is forcibly abducted and brutally raped by a drunken stranger. Later in the film, the audience becomes aware that the perpetrator is a man called Rup Sahai who is a repeat offender of such crimes. As with the previous film, there is no ambiguity as to the circumstances of the rape in this adaptation, lending the test figure here a clear sense of victimhood. Kajri, who becomes pregnant as a result of rape, is pleaded uh, to marry an older man in order to maintain her respectability, but in order to avoid this, she flees the village and secretly gives birth to her baby elsewhere. Despite her efforts, the baby dies and Kajri meets priest Dharam Bhushan, Soman's father, to request that the child be cremated with proper religious rites. Despite Kajri's pleas, the priest refuses. 
Kajri buries the baby during a scene of rain and thunder, the pathetic fallacy symbolizing her prematurely extinguished motherhood. A year passes and Somen and Kajri meet again, but in a different locale. Somen finds Kajri working at his uncle Nandalal's farm, standing in for Talbothe's dairy, and his love for her blossoms anew. He tries to express his love towards her, but she remains evasive because of her traumatic experiences and the fear of being looked upon as impure. She writes a letter to Somen confessing that she was a rape victim and, victim and consequently an unwed mother, which led to her being unjustly ostracized, which does not re reach him. Though Kajri loves Somen, the misfortune of her past weighs on her mind at every moment. Both films make use of the mislaid letter as a trope for me for misunderstanding between the lovers. Kajri and Somen are engaged in Nandalal's dairy farm, but Dharam Bhushan arrives at the uh, critical juncture and reveals that Kajri had once come to him requesting to cremate her dead child, even though she did not know the child's father's name. Somen, unaware of Kajri's past, prepares to desert her, angry and hurt that he, per that he perceives as a deception and, and, uh, and probably being uh, made to feel along with the bystanders that she is after all not a woman who is uh, who is considered to be pure it is nandalal who intervenes and reveals the truth about kajri in a dramatic revelation by kajri's aunt the audience comes to know that the man who raped kajri is Rup Sahai, who had once raped her aunt as well, along with several other village bells who had been driven to ostracism and prostitution because of this crime that, has been, that had been perpetrated against them. Here we witness the filmmaker relying heavily upon the element of chance and coincidence in common with Hardy's own philosophy. Thus, unlike in the previous movie adaptation, the villain, vil, villain of Prem Granth lacks the suave and seductive charms of uh, uh, of Alec, which comes closer to Hardy's um, depiction of the original Alec uh, in the novel. Roop Sahai is a debauchee and a womanizer with a record of violent crimes against women behind him. In the Denuma, Kajri reveals to Shri, uh, travels to Shripur to reveal the truth about Roop Sahai and then sets, sets on fire uh, by Kajri, Soman and, and, and then he is set on fire by Kajri, Soman and Baliram in a in, in common with the gruesome way in which he has previously destroyed most of his victims. Soman and Kajri are now able to marry. So this film has a happy ending. It may be thus concluded that the revenge in Bright of a Night is rather personal and closer in spirit to Hardy's characterization of Tess and her motives in our novel, while the revenge which Kajri exacts is perhaps more communal. She kills the man who has perpetrated crimes against several innocent women like her. Another difference between the adaptations is that the backdrop of the Shera, though spectacular, is the antithesis of the desperate murder of Tess uh, and Alec by Tess in order to be reunited with Angel, which the earlier movie faithfully reenacts with much success. The ending of Prem Granth distances itself from the tragic grandeur of the original novel with its virtue-rewarded ending for its heroine. Also, its use of often garish colours and vivid dance and song sequences alongside the explicit sexual scenes makes this film far more titillating for a heterogeneous audience but removes the somberness of Hardy's masterpiece. Dulhan Ek Raat Ki with its black and white format um, uh, and lack of exuberance retains the sense of tragedy and helplessness of Tess. And um, I stumbled upon this trend in Bollywood to adapt Hollywood uh, uh, Hardy novels quite late in my research upon Hardy and was rather surprised to discover that Indian commercial cinema had attempted to adapt the works of a, such, of, of a sombre writer as him. The appeal and relevance of Hardy's novels is indeed universal. Able to be identifiable with a culturally different rustic population, nonetheless subject to the same kind of fate as Tess and her family. Yet at the same time, what unifies Hardy's novels with the Indian adaptations are the sexual double, double standards of a contemporary society which sought to make sure that the woman always pays, a maxim as true for 19th century England as it was for modern Indian society emergent in the 1940s and 50s and 60s. Before concluding, it would be now necessary to look at the transnational adaptation of Tess by Michael Winterbottom in his film Trishna, uh, 
released in 2011. Today, largely owing to him, Tess's adaptation of Krishna, in which the action of Hardy's 19th century rustic setting is transported to an Indian semi-urban setting in Rajasthan, uh, has become has has uh, become uh, popular to Indian audiences. Such cultural appropriations are becoming familiar to Western audiences too. However, despite the tragic intensity of the finale of Krishna, the movie largely disappoints in terms of conflating perhaps the clearly distinguishable binaries that Hardy sought to establish between the characters uh, of Angel and Alec. This culturally transposed adaptation brings several pertinent points to the forefront with relation to post-colonial studies and its discourse of multiple, multiple and alternative modernities and ideology of improvement which retaliate against capitalistic western modernities superimposed upon the global south by European colonialism. Vivian Y. Kao in her recent and path-breaking book Post-colonial screen adaptations and the British novel offers an in-depth critique of capitalist modes of modernity and formation of anti-improvement discourse. Its chief contribution would be of making a novel point about 19th century British texts as inherently containing the seeds of the critique of colonial notions of improvement, which are amply and effectively utilized by their 20th century screen adaptations. The book attempts to use development theory or improvement ideology as the lens through which to reread 19th century classics of British fiction and its modern film adaptations, thereby pointing out how they discover, critique and utilize tropes of anti-improvement inherent in those very texts to tackle the threats of neo-capitalism. The book contests and questions the premise of development that being bad at capitalism means being backward, stunted, imperfect and unfree. It is divided into several subsections which collectively seek to address the question, and, uh, the question how post-colonial film adaptations appropriate British fiction to speak of contemporary global power inequalities, colonial legacies and to set up aggressive resistance. And, I'm, and, and, I, and I find this book and its premise very, very pertinent uh, uh, when, he, uh, when, uh, when, when she applies this in a chapter on Tess and Trishna which is called Unaccustomed Modernities in Tess and Krishna, which uses the, this lens of multiple modernities as an alternative both to 19th century improvement ideology and its later revisionist discourse of critique. Following critical theorists such as Dipesh Chakraborty and Paul Gilroy, who emphasize the need for finding ways to decenter classical Western modernity in order to expose its underbelly, this chapter by Kao champions the role of Tess and Trishna, both the novel Tess and the film adaptation by Winterbottom, as representatives of alternative conceptions of modernity which refute the improvement ideologies of the text's male characters. While aligning Thomas Hardy and his Wessex novels with multiple modernities is a novel take. The author, however, sometimes makes this reductive claim that instead of trying to recover and reclaim, Hardy registers the possibilistic by drawing attentions to its obsolescence. Uh, and that, I think, will be open for critical uh, contestation and difficult to admit in the light of exhaustive studies which have focused on Hardy's uh, uh, ideas of improvement ethics and materialist criticism. The analysis of the motivation of Alec and Angel in this uh, book of the uh, 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 the comparison between the novel and the film uh, as improvers has however been probed with depth and clarity whereby their single-minded desire to turn history to profit is shown as wreaking disastrous effects on the people and environment that they come in contact with both in the case of Alec and Angel. Cow will brilliantly decodes Winterbottom's technique of conflating the film's viewers with the male improvers of Hardy. And though the former is offender and the latter rescuer, the latter does so with the same intention of improving Tess or Trishna in the case of the film adaptation, according to their notion of a modern subject. And I quote from the book, the viewer's desire to hear the voice of the globally southern woman speaker speaking the West's own script close quotes, is something that uh, uh, Keo very, very uh, brilliantly probes into. 
The book's silent erosion of narrative is replicated in Trishna's passivity and the tourist gaze depicted in the film is reminiscent of the imperial gaze. The theorizing of Kaplan, Gayatri Spivak and Trin Minha are utilized to emphasize that unaccounted experiences in the novel and the film adaptation by this, uh, the Hollywood film adaptation circumvent capitalistic and academic agendas of improvement. And that I find is a very, very novel take, uh, a, a very novel take on uh, looking at Hardy's Tess novel and its uh, Hollywood adaptation and uh, that is how these um, uh, understanding the trans cultural and uh, uh, cross cultural uh, uh, adaptations are important and are uh, a sort of sort of uh, change our way of looking at uh, uh, discourses of improvement and finally I as I mentioned I would want to uh, conclude or wind up by mentioning that Bollywood had also tried to adapt uh, the other Hardy novel, The Mayor of Casterbridge, in a film titled Dark, which roughly translates uh, to The Blemish. The adaptation was a roaring success, and it is interesting how easily, by a reverse cultural appropriation, Hardy's Casterbridge transposes to an Indian town with the figure of a man with a past shrouded in mystery. The major theme in the novel of a man's bid to escape his blemished past and start afresh and yet suffer a setback at the zenith of his power perhaps resonated with Indian audiences verging towards universality and a man pushed towards crime as a mere puppet in the hands of destiny had an appeal beyond the barriers of geography geography and temporality. Perhaps this will be the subject of a later talk or a, or a lecture but this uh, but, but what I wanted to highlight is that uh, not only this in recent years I have also discovered a very very uh, good remake uh, or perhaps unconscious adaptation of one of Hardy's short stories about which I have written elsewhere uh, which is called um, uh, which has been uh, which is this which is this uh, story from uh, life's little ironies on the western circuit which has been made into uh, an uh, uh, obviously it is not a, a conscious adaptation but the way which goes on to show that how uh, great writers and uh, thinkers perhaps think uh, alike across cultures and across, across ages where this uh, 2013 film called The Lunchbox made by Bollywood with the noted actor Irfan Khan who passed away very recently uh, has been made into this beautiful movie this muted story of uh, uh, Edith Hanham and uh, her link up with this young lawyer Charles uh, has been sort of uh, very well depicted in this Bollywood film. So this idea of this again proves that the elements of universality, the elements of uh, these these very very uh, credible relationships between men and women that Hardy was depicting are uh, continuously appealing for uh, Indian audiences and filmmakers. Thus, these Hindi language adaptations by Indian popular cinema with mixed results and various degrees of quality were nevertheless successful in adapting an English regional setting to the Indian socio-cultural matrix. Being well received by Indian audiences who could identify with the stories of exploitation of educated but economically challenged and socially underprivileged women, women by a ruthless patriarchal society or the stigma of unwed motherhood and the need for a father's name to save face for a woman regardless of social class. Most Bollywood films unfortunately did not acknowledge the contribution of Hardy to their plots owing chiefly to the story writers claiming them to be their own creations. So the screen screenplay writers would uh, uh, take up the credit of all these uh, uh, the plots. It is still worth recognizing that through the popular medium of Hindi mainstream cinema, Hardy's works have been able to reach all sections of Indian society, many unknown to its own population, because cinema alone is that medium of entertainment in India. It still remains so despite the OTT platforms to which we have moved now. Uh, which has a mass appeal and obviously the years that these adaptations were being made 1960s, 1950s and even 1990s 
that was the time of uh, 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 cinema and uh, the even single uh, screen theatres and a, a medium of entertainment which has a mass, mass appeal and is capable of touching the lives of all Indians, bridging barriers of class, caste, social class and educational opportunities. So it is with this that I wanted to end up and try to give an idea of the way that these cultural appropriations, uh, departures and being, uh, being loyal to the source text in different ways uh, produced uh, some level of uh, uh, different kind of a product perhaps from the original but nevertheless popularized or made Hardy accessible to uh, those sections of Indian society who perhaps would never have uh, been sort of acquainted with him in their lifetime. And uh, thank you once again for being uh, giving me this opportunity to be able to share my ideas and my continuing research on Hardy and Indian uh, cinema. And uh, at a later date, I hope to be able to share more about the findings that I, uh, I uh, intend to uh, research on. Thank you once again and it would have been a pleasure to meet every one of you in person, all my friends at Dorchester, fellow scholars uh, and Hardy enthusiasts and at a later date in a, in a better world where I think uh, Covid will be uh, a thing of the past, we will once again meet in Dorchester and uh, be able to share our views and uh, if anybody has any questions or anything to say or any, any anything to discuss uh, I'm sure Tracy will be able to forward my email ID to them and uh, I will be glad to answer and discuss things uh, uh, with anybody who's interested. Thanks, thank you so much and uh, wish you good night.